Oh, I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? Somewhere between science and superstition. We have such sights to show you. Strange Eons. Welcome to Strange Eons Radio, where we are celebrating the one-year anniversary of locking down for two weeks. Ooh. Wow, really? So that's, uh, that's Eric Margaret over there. Hello. Uh, that's Vanessa Williams over there. Hello. I'm Kelly Young. You want to know what else is exciting, guys? Yeah. I had a massive plumbing issue last <gasps> week, and the plumber came in, and you will no longer hear the, uh, the sink farts. What? Oh. No what more did gurgling. They do? Well, while they cleared the the whole thing out, uh, the sink had um had kind of started filling up with water while the outside was filling up with snow. Oh, and I uh, oh. I called the management and they were like, uh oh. <laughs> and uh, the best part, of course, couldn't get a plumber here because, as yep. you know, we had seventeen inches of snow and yeah. uh, nobody could go anywhere. And it turns out that my kitchen sink which I don't put food in or anything, mm -hmm. it is illegally tapped into the the back of it. The neighbor's bathroom sink is there. And I was like, well, why would they be putting food down or anything? Uh, no, he pulls out a frightening amount of black, long black hair. Oh, yeah. oh geez. <laughs> Oof. Oh, God. Oof. Yeah. So. That's so messed up. I mean, is it still hooked up? Is this a future issue that may come again? Well, I mean, remember the building was built yeah. in 1915. Oh, so, okay. and then gotcha. it was it was a Chinese laundromat back then, and through the years it has been all sorts of things, doctors' offices and all that stuff. And then it was finally converted to living space, and that's why my my layout is so fucking weird. Yeah. And so, I don't know if if these sinks were put in at some time as like just doctor's sinks or something. And then they decided when they were going to um, turn it into living space, they would <laughs> just keep connecting it all yeah. together and all yeah. that. You know, my, I, I don't have a fuse box for my space. Oh, are you serious? Yeah. And I, and my PUD bill is split. I get a bill that I pay 60% of and my neighbors pay 40% of based on square footage. Oh my God. But weird. what if you never use your electricity? Oh, you mean like I never do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like you. Uh, that's so crazy. That's yeah, not a that's good way. Weird. To, that's a bad system. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> you well, are right. I had fun work done too. I know you did. This yeah. is why I brought it up. I wanted to hear all about your... Yeah. Oh, a while ago. Mold. A while oh ago. God. We had a uh, mold stain on our ceiling which we kind of had for probably longer than we should have, but it was in an area on top of our stairs, which you cannot safely reach unless you buy a certain kind of ladder mm -hmm. and there's just no way to get to it. And so we finally brought someone in. Well, the fun of why we had a mold stain is a design flaw, kind of like what you were just talking oh, about. I thought you were going to tell me dead body in the attic. Oh my no, God. I think we would have smelled that too. <laughs> um, but, Although there were a lot of wasp bodies up there, apparently, <laughs> according to the guy who did, it's like, God, there's a lot of wasps up here. No shit. But um, so a couple years ago when they cleaned out the upstairs, because the original people who designed the building, when they put in the uh, laundry rooms for each of the units, they just vented it into the crawl space above. Oh, my God. Like the attic area was not big enough to be called an attic. Well, your place was built in 1915 also, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 90s. Yeah, I know. <laughs> what the fuck, man? Oh, and so we had to have somebody come in and extend all of those out. And, and then when he opened up to pull out the mold part of the ceiling, he pulled it. It's like, uh, your boards above this are still wet. Oh, no. my God. Like, oh, my God. So we had to have an inspector come out and looked at it. And he said, it's, I don't know why it's in this one space. There's no holes above you. There's nothing there. It's just maybe never dried because by the, and then the, he left said, you're fine to continue. So the drywall guy came back and he's like, oh yeah, it's like 70% drier than it was when I cracked this thing open. Hmm. So there's just some weird capture of moisture going on there. So, you know, 
cut a hole up. And the fun part of doing drywall of a large space like that is cut it, put the crap on it. He has to let it dry for a day, sand and put the texture on that he's got to come back and next day to paint as I go. Oh, luckily, the guy was really cool. I uh, started exchanging ideas for shows to watch, and I sent him, like, The Boys and watch. He's like, oh, yeah, I've already seen those. I said, okay. <laughs> and he came back, have you seen Cobra Kai? I'm like, yeah, I've seen Cobra Kai. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll probably be keeping in contact with this guy for oh. a while. He did Next, really good work, too, man. Next week, so we have good. a special guest, and it's the guy who worked on Eric's house. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Telling us his picks. And um, a plumber comes tomorrow. Oh, nice. I, <laughs> I've seen enough Asian horror to know that if you've got a wet spot in your house, yes. there's I was going to say, I was problems. trying to work out what it was reminding me of, your mold stain <laughs> that you so kindly shared with us. Yeah. It yeah. looks just like the dead body stain in uh, Cairo. <laughs> okay, a pulse. I was like, oh, okay, that's what, you just got a people disintegrating into the walls here. Yeah, well. Some secrets come out. All right. <laughs> 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 hey, Vanessa, I watched a movie that you're going to want to watch. It's oh. on Prime and it's old and it's uh, almost three hours long. <laughs> oh, my God. And yes. it is called Day of Resurrection. Okay. Uh, 1973, at the time, the most expensive Japanese movie ever made. Oh, oh um, okay. Made by Toho, but full of American actors because they knew that they wanted to go for an international release. So it's got all these really amazing Japanese actors from the old samurai movies and stuff alongside a bunch of our famous actors at the time, some of which you can tell are just kind of there for a paycheck, but really interesting. <laughs> it is a, uh, it's disaster porn of the highest order <gasps> because it starts <laughs> off with a virus okay. that is taking okay. over the world and, uh, and everybody is dying on except for these people who can make it to, um, to this Antarctic base. Okay, I like where this is going. <laughs> and uh, so the movie also takes place over years and years. So the, the last stragglers make it to the Antarctic base and uh, they decide, you know, they're going to kind of restart humanity. Uh, one girl to every three guys. They have a discussion about this. Oh Girls, you may be doubling up. You have a duty. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> and uh, And then it goes on, I think it, jumps like 10 years later and you can see that the Antarctic base is thriving, lots of children running around. <laughs> uh, but they have figured out that there is going to be, cause this is all scientists and everything who are down there. Uh, they see that uh, there is going to be a big uh, like extinction level earthquake on the East coast of the United States, okay. which is not a big deal cause nobody's there, right? Except for what is there is underneath the White House is this uh, <laughs> this uh, nuclear plan base thing that if if a if a um, shock wave of enough magnitude happens there, it actually sends a signal oh, to the satellites in oh space that will launch all the nukes. Whoa, that's really well thought out. <laughs> so now they're like racing against time to get there before this earthquake. The virus still is. It takes out everything. So it's still floating around. They've got an experimental vaccine. <laughs> the earthquake happens and the nukes go off. Yes. And that's not the end of the movie. Oh, my God. So, I, I mean, it's it's wow. literally two hours and 47 minutes long or something. I was oh like, I, sh I what, need to tell Vanessa. What is this so again? Sold. It is called Day of Resurrection. Okay. Well, I'm gonna, Damn. I'm it might be it. under the, the title Virus on Prime. Um Whatever you do, make sure you don't get the 90 minute version. Okay. So there's an alternative version floating around that. The 90 I don't minute want. version wow. uh, cuts out all of the Japanese actors. And since it's a Japanese film, most of the actual storyline is happening <laughs> with them. So yeah. they, they release like an Americanized version that I guess is just shit. Oh my God. I can't imagine. <laughs> it's just like missing all the main parts. Yes. Here's the release version for all those people who really, really suffered in World War II. Right. <laughs> we just can't get past certain things. Man, it just hit everything for me with my, my 70s love and yeah. uh, the disaster porn. There was some, there were some good, really good performances mm -hmm. of people having to deal with the fact that, um, oh, this is the end of the world, you know, uh, mm -hmm. not, not in uh, the day after tomorrow kind of ways, but in real ways that made you think, this yeah. is rough. That's, I mean, that's what I loved about Atomic Train. 
Is it just was like, no, it, yeah, goes off. <laughs> <laughs> and like, yeah, people die. <laughs> the families never find each other. Like, it was just so, I mean, it was, you know, made for TV action, but it was just like, yeah, yeah, no, he gets hit by a car and he's dead now. So don't worry about him. You're like, what? what? Okay. <laughs> like, it, one of the more depressing films I ever watched, unfortunately, I'm blanking on the name because it was a while ago, was an end of the world kind of thing. And one of the key things, if you'd seen it, you'd remember the guy who works for, I think, the electric plant spends the, his last night on Earth calling all the people thanking him for their business. Oh, wow. oh my God. And there's, it's just one uh. of the most depressing movies I have ever seen. Oh, my God. <laughs> Gee, that rings a bell. That's not Threads, is it? No, it, no. I, I haven't seen that threads, one. I haven't, but... I'm aware of that film, but I haven't seen it yet. It wasn't that. It's a little more art housey. Okay. And less. It wasn't necessarily intended to be a scary, like threads, but it was just uh, what realistically what might happen mm. to it. It's just like oh, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. So, yes. You know, it's okay. I don't remember because I wouldn't recommend watching it right now. <laughs> yes, I I would recommend a book that looks like a children's book called When the Wind Blows which is about a British couple hunkering down during oh. a nuclear explosion and then wow. dying. Don't they do an animated? I think there's they an do. animated There's an version. animated yeah. version. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Fuck, I'm writing that down right now. <laughs> I, yeah. yeah. It's impress <laughs> That's an impressive one. I was gifted a copy of it for Christmas one year because my aunt was like, <laughs> we've been talking about it. And she was like, wow, you're really into this. And I was like, yeah. And she was hunted it down and was like, here's a copy of this book that looks like it's for children. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, um, I also checked out a disaster film that I hadn't, I had not yet come across slash actually bothered to watch. <laughs> um, and I was angry at myself for not seeing it sooner, which was The Core. Oh, yeah. I remember this, but I, and now I'm going to be embarrassed that I haven't watched it. I, I haven't seen it, it either, but. Oh my God. Like, yeah. I, Cause I was just, I, I think I just thought, oh, it's going to be another really dumb one. But our standards of what's dumb and good <laughs> at this point has shifted. And this dumb film is actually very fun. Um, they have to, like, I mean, everyone knows what this is about, but they have to drill down to Earth's center because the, the stuff has stopped moving around in it. And they have to get it to move around again, the core, the liquid magma they got a jump start they the got earth. a jump start the <laughs> earth and uh one of the people involved may or may not be the reason why it stopped in the first place what oh. dun, dun, dun. wait a second so are you you, you telling me i gotta see this movie um okay it's so <laughs> jules verne it's oh, weird wow. it's i was not expecting that it gets very journey to the center of the earth part way oh. in there's like a lot of like and now we're in this part. No one knew what it looked like before. And now we do. Like, it's actually really pretty fun. When did this come out? 90s. Or maybe I have seen this because that sounds really familiar. Yeah, it's um, Hilary Swank, I oh, believe. And, yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. Yep. It's like kind of an all-star cast. Yeah, it does. It has a huge sleeve. Yeah, and it's um, Eckhart. Aaron Eckhart? Who's the guy? Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty uh, sure I have seen that. Yeah, he's very dreamy. A dreamy scientist. <laughs> he definitely <laughs> is a scientist and not a movie star. <laughs> um, uh, was this on your Netflix queue or did you see it this was on in something? my amazon queue so it, i watched it for free okay for sure i'm watching um, this tonight yeah no it was so fun it yeah i i was really happy to come across it again it's much better than deep impact i think deep impact's a lot of fun yeah mm. it, it, it is but yeah like i i agree with kelly it's not my favorite <laughs> no it's not <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's not my top 10 disaster movies is the core uh, maybe. Wow. Holy shit. It might be. It might be. It's near the bottom of the 10, but it's still up there somewhere. There's a lot of disaster movies. That's, that's, that's pretty generous. <laughs> well, I saw one completely not like any of those at all. Mm -hmm. uh, Lose the Flower of Evil. Oh, okay. From 2019. Have not even heard of this. Directed by Juan Diego Escobar Alzate. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> that's a name. Uh, it's a. I think if Kelly watched it, he would think it's an A24 film. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, but um, it is the story of a devout father <laughs> who's um, convinced that he has found the rebirth of Jesus and has tied him up outside 
with his three daughters trying to live inside and work around their father's obvious insanity. One of the daughters finds a man and enjoys his company, shall we say. Oh, and the dad is, of course, furious about this. And mm -hmm. it's because uh, as longtime listeners of this show know, I have no problem with the A24 films. I actually enjoy a lot of them. And mm -hmm. slow moving movies are kind of I like. This is too slow. There's too. There's a combination of too many people putting up with too much BS. Right. Because these aren't like five-year-old girls. These are full adult women. Right. And they're still putting up with the shit the dad's doing. And the, right. Except one's sort of trying to rebel, but then she kind of doesn't. It's just mm. really good performances. Gorgeous shot. Holy crap. You know, I think it was last week or week before I was complaining about day for night shooting. They nailed it in this movie. It is gorgeous. But, uh, I mean, you know, if you like religious kooks gone crazy kind of movies, this mm -hmm. would probably appeal to you a lot more. But this was just not, it was good, but it just wasn't, it's nothing I'll ever watch again. Is it, was it American or foreign? No, no, it's uh, I was gonna say, Spanish, what's, I think. Yeah, what's, Spanish, the, what's the spelling on this? L-U-Z? Yeah. Yeah, so Spanish or Mexican. Uh, mm. And that might have something to do with the way the women are portrayed. It's a different culture. Yeah. Uh, that's true, actually. That is very true. As somebody who walked through Italy in the year 2002, it was startling. <laughs> so don't, don't walk through even the nicest places alone at night as a chick. You're, you might not get assaulted, but you're going to get a lot of stuff said to you. So. Uh, well, with that in mind, I saw a movie. <laughs> Wait, oh, boy, it's a lot to pick from for there. So let's see where right. this goes. By the uh, male feminist Paul W.S. Anderson called Monster Hunter. Oh, oh, I've sure. been seeing a lot about it, except With, uh, Mila Jovovich. Yeah. I mean, I know the game exists. So it it took me till the end credits to realize this was based on a game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it I should have dawned on me as I was watching this stupid fucking movie <laughs> because it progresses like a video game. It, this is a really, really bad movie with an amazing third act that makes you oh. feel like, oh, fuck. This was worth it. <laughs> it wow. was so much fun at the end because uh, in the third act, uh, Ron Perlman suddenly shows up. Oh, yeah. And it just kind of like takes over the movie and you're like, oh, fuck. Elevates everything. Yeah. So <laughs> the monsters are cool, but it is not what I was hoping based on the trailer, which was a bunch of army soldiers going to a world and fighting monsters. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's basically just her. Going to this world oh, and fighting so it's monsters. way more like the video game. Resident oh, okay. Evil yeah. part whatever. <laughs> right. So, you know, and so I guess if you're a fan of this game, you might enjoy it. Uh, I wanted something a little bit more and then I got it in the third act. <laughs> oh, wow, that's cool. So, hmm. but. Uh, Should we know. just like watch it and just watch the last 20 minutes or do you need well, the rest of the film to lead up and make it really worth it. <laughs> well, you know, you know, Paul W.S. Anderson. There's, oh, yeah. there's a lot of layers. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> some, some heavy duty filmmaking going on there. <laughs> um, well, wow. I finally got around to watching um, Cobra Kai and oh. I passed one season. So I'm like uh, starting the second season now. Yeah. Man, that is a fun show. It is so good. I didn't, I didn't so expect good. that. I mean, I should have, I didn't really know anything at all about it. Mm -hmm. um, other than like one of the guys from uh, Paper Tigers is in season three yeah. as the main baddie. He's from, was it Karate Kid 3? Three, yeah. I think two. so. Was Karate Kid 2. Was it two? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, that's um, right. When he goes, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he's one of the producers. I didn't even know he was an actor. And I've been like hanging out with this dude and was like, oh my God, what? Wait, you're in what? And doesn't, he's in Better Off Dead. Doesn't he have like a restaurant here? He does. Someplace? Yeah. I've eaten at his restaurant. It's very nice. Nice. It's like yeah. a Hawaiian place that I cannot remember the name of right now. Oh, but, too bad. Kona, um, Kona, Kona Kitchen. Kitchen, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, he's a sweetheart. Yeah, nice. He's such a nice dude. And his wife is amazing. His whole family's great. But, um, aside, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and watch this Cobra Kai thing. I didn't realize it's like from the perspective and um, living through it from the bad guy's perspective from karate. Sort of. Kid. I was afraid it was going to be too much of that. Kind of yeah. like, I'm not a big fan of Wicked because yeah. I got 
oh, she just, whatever. And so I wasn't too sure I was going to like Cobra Kai, but I think they do a really good job of balancing. Oh, they do. I, I mean, love that Johnny they make is it so gray. small of a portion in the originally, you yeah. know, yeah. that fleshing him out at all just makes him feel so much deeper. Right. But I think uh, they're all, I don't know, I think it's just, a, it's one of my favorite TV shows, like, period. It's <laughs> Yeah, it's been really good. And I like that it's not, it knows what it is. Yeah. And that's been really nice because I was just like, thinking it was going to be more straight Karate Kid. And I was like, oh, I don't know. No. I don't know. I need that in my life. <laughs> and instead, it's like very funny. It's very poignant. There's a lot of like really interesting exchanges and changes. And and like the actual guy who played the Karate Kid who's in it is like a kind of a douche. And I love that. I was like, <laughs> yeah, you became like whatever that kid would have grown up to be. Like a freaking <laughs> car salesman, dude. Are you familiar with all of the Karate Kid movies? I am not. I only so know you, of you the... do need to watch two and three to yeah. get the benefit of everything that's happening. Yeah, in this especially show. especially with the third season. Mm, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> I mean, three's two's fine. Three's pushing. Do I have the to watch the, the but... I love Jason three Smith mm -hmm. one as well? I actually like that movie. I just wish they hadn't called it. The Karate Kid, yeah. since it takes place in China and he's being taught Kung Fu. And he's like, what, oh. eight years old? <laughs> I, I, I think he's like 12 or something team. like that. Yeah. Keep in mind, uh, what's his name? Why can't I think of who plays? Daniel? Well, he was in high school. And we'll he was in high school, but he was a 27-year-old playing well, yeah. high school <laughs> kids. So. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess that's Daniel right. LaRusso. Yeah. LaRusso. Whoever that actor is. Yeah, why can't I think of his name? Yeah. Uh, I think that... Um, the. The second one is, I think the second one's a little more melodramatic than it has to oh, be. Yeah. And the third one is ridiculous fun because the bad guy is is so evil mm -hmm. that <laughs> I wish I loved anything as much as he loves being evil. He, <laughs> he, he literally laughs while he's doing evil things and yeah. shit. I'm just like, oh man, this guy needs a mustache to twirl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also watched a little bit of the making of and the, the guys who put it together obviously from the final product, love the Karate Kid. And there's a lot of talks. They were having a real hard time getting the guy who played Johnny because he, for a little bit until he read it, <laughs> he's like, oh crap. And then, but and the same thing with the, the guy whose name we can't remember played LaRusso. He didn't want to come back because he didn't want to be quite the way you're watching him. Because I don't watch him as a douche. I watch him as a fairly successful guy. He's not mean to his employees. No, he's, he's not. He's yeah. great with his kids and his wife. But he is a car salesman. <laughs> I think it's more that he he's like a goody two shoes in an irritating way. Well, sure. And they that, acknowledge that. Yeah, yeah, and that I fits. really appreciate that a lot. I'm like, yes, like I like his character too, but I'm yeah. also like, all right. Well, I also think that uh Johnny has fallen a lot further, so you're rooting a lot harder yeah. for him. Yeah, yes, definitely. For sure. Definitely. And yeah, they weren't gonna do it if they couldn't get anybody everybody on board. Really? Yeah. They're basically uh, greenlit to do it, but they're like, only if we pull it off and hey, yay. <laughs> I can only assume, and you know, I, I haven't seen the rest of it, but they couldn't get the girl because they keep talking about the girl. Keep watching. All right. Because <laughs> I was just like, they, they just, I that moment where they're in the bar and like, he pulls out a picture of her and it's like, what's she up to? And look her up on Facebook. Oh, she's married to that guy. Super handsome man. Hmm. I was like, this feels a lot like a... Couldn't get this actress moment, mm. but I, maybe I'm wrong. Keep, keep watching. Like, yeah. Mm, I think it's more like, uh, don't worry, we didn't forget her. Yeah. Oh. What would have been great is if, if they said, what's she doing now? Holy shit, she's starring in <laughs> The Boys. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, I, I did watch a, a martial arts film, not along those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm continuing with my Al Adamson box set of 32 movies. And uh, came up to 1977's Black Samurai, starring Jim Kelly. I did not realize that this movie <laughs> was by that guy and that you have it. I've been searching for this movie forever. Oh, well, it's I not on Prime or definitely, anything. Definitely loan that to you. Thank you. It's garbage, but it's awesome garbage. <laughs> Holy shit, it is so bad. He is... Jim Kelly plays an agent of Dragon, Defense Reserve Agency Guardian of Nations. Yes. Which, you know, that right there tells you what kind of a film you're dealing with. Here. They, wasted, they wasted the O on of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that acronym, that's not. <laughs> 
But uh, Jim Kelly gets a nice amount of fights. He even fights with a bird at one point. Ooh. Awesome. And uh, there, it's this almost became one of our, our next subject of cult films. I was looking at this one for cult films because it's got a satanic cult involved with it, too. Hey, how do, how do you know what the next selection how of, shocking uh, <laughs> i don't know how you would be aware hmm. i haven't to reveal <laughs> right yet to you guys what you all research yes our, our well-known secrets <laughs> <laughs> we have so many but uh yeah it's definitely worth watching and Ooh. like i was telling you earlier when i was setting the gear up that the al adamson set is sort of a di- i've been watching it chronologically as he made him and it's sort of a diminishing return shall we say hmm. is a lot of his best stuff was in the 60s and early 70s, and now it's starting to fade. This is still one of the fun ones. <laughs> and this was 77, you said? Yeah. So four years after Enter the Dragon. Yeah. I wonder what Jim Kelly was doing in all those years. Was it just a bunch of kung fu movies? He or? did quite a few. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to look that up. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's fun. <laughs> well, cool. Um, we well, should take a little break, but just before we do that, I just want to say, Eric, you mm. had a recommendation of Bloody Hell. Oh, yes. Uh, and I, I watched it, and it's firmly in my top five of this year so far. Nice. Wow. I, I had so much fun with that movie. Really? That movie is ridiculous. Oh, yeah. And you didn't sell <laughs> the comedy level as, <laughs> as much as in there. The fact that he talks to himself and his other self is such a prick. Yes. <laughs> is so funny. So I I really, yeah, I really, really love that. So thank you very much for that. Very cool. Excellent. Your turn uh, to watch it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I'll have to check this out. That sounds great. It's it's ridiculous. I, I just was, as funny as it was, I didn't expect it to also be as good as it was. Yeah. The acting was yeah. great and uh, everything made sense. It, yeah. Anyway, that's all I got to say. Let's take a break. We are coming back with a uh, toxic relationship. <laughs> Mr. Yuck is me. Mr. Yuck is free. Home is full of lots of things that children shouldn't touch. Home is full of bad things that can hurt you very much. Now there's a man whose face is green that you ought to get to know. He'll warn you when danger's coming fast or slow. Get to know his face in every single place. When you see it, you'll know quick. Things marked yuck make you sick. Sick, sick, sick. Sick, sick, sick. Mr. Yuck is me. Mr. Yuck is green. We have returned. Eric, this was your genre topic. Well, yes. Yes, it is. Why don't you go first then? Talking about toxic relationships. Maybe a little more than just their bad relationship, but one you're watching where the people in the movie may not necessarily know they're in a bad one, but we sure as hell do. (laughs) So I went with uh, 2018's Beast. Yes. 
Tomatoes, ninety two from the critics, seventy five from the audience. So, damn, it's well liked. I don't think I've heard of this. Yeah, I haven't. I either. no idea this movie existed until like two or three weeks ago. I was going, oh, this looks good, and it's actually why I came up with this, <laughs> this subject. Uh, budget couldn't find, although it did have almost a one point seven million dollar box office. So it did a pretty good festival style run with probably extra screenings afterwards. Directed by Michael Pierce and written by Michael Pierce. This is his first feature. He's done a few shorts and he's working on an alien invasion movie. Mm. It's an interesting change of <laughs> styles, but all right. It's his real passion project. That's right. Uh, the star of the film, the main male star is 2020's he, Johnny Flynn, who was in 2020's Emma. Oh, I have seen this. Okay. You've seen Beast? Yeah, I know okay. Johnny Flynn. <laughs> Yeah, he's he like know him, know, know him, know him. Oh, okay, he's pretty good in this. He's very good in this. Uh, played David Bowie in Stardust, and uh, the lady is Jesse Buckley. She was in the deeply disturbing Chernobyl, uh, Fargo TV show, and I'm thinking of ending things. So they're both fairly active. And uh, Geraldine Dames James rounds off. She was in Downton Abbey, Rogue One, and Utopia. So he found a pretty good cast for his first feature. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, idea of the movie is there's a woman who's growing up in an isolated, it doesn't seem like that small of a town, but the isolated community. Her family is not nice, shall we say. Mm. And she finds the very nice and appealing guy to fall in love with. <laughs> but uh, the it opens up at her birthday and uh, during her birthday, her older sister announces that she's having twins. Subsequently, her family completely ignores her. So she she leaves. She just leaves her birthday and goes out uh, to a bar and just starts partying at a bar and flirting with a guy. And uh, the next scene is her on the beach in the morning with the guy. And it's obviously they haven't like been home to a bedroom or anything like that. But he starts to get a little, shall we say, handsy. And along comes our hero, <clears throat> Johnny, who... <laughs> Rescues her from the guy and uh, takes her home and is you know, really nice and interesting, but a little dangerous because he's been poaching rabbits or something. <laughs> Stopped by the cops. And so you get that little moment of, ooh, he's a bit of a bad boy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, playing David Boy, he's he's not an ugly man. Right. <laughs> she comes home to the family. Her family already ate like most of her birthday cake and uh, <laughs> mom is completely completely nasty to her for not, for just disappearing. So, you know, you get the family dynamics right away and you're like, hmm, your mom's horrible. I don't like her. <laughs> <laughs> but she has weird dreams. She's got dark dreams of a hooded person attacking her and stabbing her in the chest and uh, wakes up to find the sliding glass door downstairs is open. She hires him to do some work around the house and that's when they start to get a little bit more flirty and uh, her parents, of course, are more or less approving during this time, an older teen girl goes missing, and uh, the family gets much more paranoid. And uh, they do, and he champions her. He works in that. Uh, there's a dinner scene with Pascal and Mole, and he stands up for her against the family. And you're kind of like, "All right, that's good to see." And they go out to a. <laughs> I really wanted to hear more of this music. They go to a British country music 
club. Oh. And there's like yeah. 30 or 40 seconds of what sounds like really strange, bad country music. Mm -hmm. And whoever was running the sound figured that out because it's quickly replaced by the score. <laughs> 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 I wanted to hear more of a British version of country music. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's special. Yeah, but I don't want to do the research. To find out. <laughs> I don't want to know that much. <laughs> mm -hmm. They finally um, consummate their relationship in the middle of the woods. Uh, but the ominous music played over does, does not indicate that, oh, well, this is a good thing going right. on. Um, they find the missing teen buried in a potato field. The police begin to suspect uh, Pascal as being involved in that. Uh, her brother is a cop and feeds her all this information about his history and his uh, criminal charges he's run into the past. Uh, she gets angry with him, but he says something really nice to her, so she goes running after him to come back to him. And, you know, toxic relationship going on here. <laughs> uh, and he gets another pet the cat kind of moment where he rescues a guy who's getting beaten up by two men at the party and... Of course, he comes back with his good assault way for why he assaulted a 15-year-old girl or whatever it is a few years ago, and she buys it. <laughs> and they seem to be becoming a happy couple again. But she starts lying for him when the cops start really asking her questions. She's like, no, no, he was the guy I was dancing with all night in the club. He is getting a little more violent with her. She runs away from him at one point from that, but then they come back, you know, so... You're getting the cycle of the film that's going on. Um, I'm going to leave the ending out of it because it's really solid and really good. And I think is built up and pays off incredibly well. This is a good movie. This is a really, really well acted film. All the characters do a fantastic job. Uh, the two leads are both... Um, Myable enough that as you're watching, they feel at times you're really annoyed with her. At times you're like, well, maybe he's not that bad. And other times you feel really bad for her. It works really well. And it's beautiful. It's a really, really well shot film. This is solid, solid filmmaking. Uh, did you like it? Um, I Yeah, I did. I I mean, I felt like the, the pacing was a little slow and I think it's mm -hmm. a dark, emotionally dark film. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so it wasn't something I enjoyed, but sure. um, yeah, I, I did, I did like it. Um, I think that like, just like you said, that the ending is a really good payoff. Mm -hmm. And I think I spent most of the time just being like, oh, it's Johnny. <laughs> what? Is that, is that, oh my God, it is. Yeah, that will pull you out of a film it pretty quick. It really made it difficult <laughs> to immerse myself in the characters. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I would say I think I have a little bit of insight onto why they went to a bad country music place, which oh, really? uh -huh. you may or may not have picked up on. I don't know. So Johnny Flynn, um, I only knew him as a musician. Oh, okay. He's a, a, oh, you've he's talked like about folk, him before. Yeah, he's a folk um, singer guy. Mm -hmm. And I, I just absolutely, he's one of my favorite uh, musicians, to be honest. I kind of semi-stalked him in the UK. <laughs> but um, my my boyfriend at the time um, was actually following him around doing music videos for him. So oh. so this bad country slash, um, I think he even did some of the soundtrack for Beast. But uh, it's kind of, I think it's a nod. It's a little nod towards that world. So, <laughs> so now I'm more curious than to find out and hear a little bit more. That yeah. sounds pretty cool. Uh, the film world premiered at what's called the Platmore, Platform Section of the Toronto International Film Festival, which is there where they show films of true promise of upcoming filmmakers. Oh. Uh, it took four days after that for the movie to be signed for release. And even though it had already premiered, it got a screening at Sundance, which really doesn't happen a lot. You know, they're, they're very much into the premieres. Won a best debut film by the British writers of the for the 72nd British Academy of Film Awards, and was also nominated for Best British Film. Director lived in Jersey, and I got to tell you, I'm an ignorant enough guy in the U.S. that when I first read Jersey, oh, no. I just thought New Jersey. Oh, then no. about four minutes later, I'm going, hold on, it's New, new for a Jersey. Ah, yeah. oh, this is back in the uh, <laughs> I think Scottish Island or something like that. 
So he lived there for a while. It's loosely based on a real person that he dubbed the Beast of Jersey, who terrorized the islands of Jersey in the 60s and 70s. So the beautiful the lead character, Johnny, is loosely based on a real. Wow. And it's shot in the Jersey area. Another reason it sounds weird, a little weird, Jersey location, the White House. What? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the overall Rotten Tomatoes consensus, I think, is pretty good. Uh, Beast plays like be- beak. Beast plays like bleak poetry, unfurling its psychological thrills while guided by its captivating leads and mesmerizing, mesmerizing visual visuals. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so firmly in the thriller camp for this yeah, one. Yeah. Uh, the title threw me off because I thought, oh, this guy's going to be a werewolf or maybe right. this is a Beauty oh, yeah, and the no. Beast kind of <laughs> thing. Um, but once you said he was based on a a actual killer. Yeah. So yeah, it sounded like he was... When you say he terrorized, I'm like, uh, how so? Yeah. Did yeah. you just annoy everybody? Knocking <laughs> on the doors? <laughs> and all, a lot of tires. Uh, <laughs> Throw a lot of eggs at windows. <laughs> huh, well, I mean, sounds like you love this. Yeah, I really liked it. It's really good. And so, what did you watch it on? What did I watch it on? <laughs> Streaming, I'm guessing you <laughs> yes, didn't rent yeah. it. So no, I think it was Amazon. Oh, I might have to look this up. Yeah, it's well worth well worth checking out. I mean, it's it is also deliberately paced, but it's not annoying in its deliberate pacing. All right. Um <laughs> so I chose a film that I've been wanting to talk about for a long time. And there have been a number of times I thought I was going to do it, but then couldn't access it or had one reason or another. So I almost did this for our dream episode. Um, But this is the 1987 film Scared Stiff. There was an opening here once. Every house has its secrets, but this secret has waited 150 years to get out. Those old bones from your attic turned out to be his life. Kid. I don't understand your fixation with those bones. And, and not just the bones, your dreams. Where are the ghosts, Kate? There's one now. Look, there's another one. I think we ought to bring her in for observation. Kay Christopher and her son, Jason, have uncovered something so ungodly, so inhuman, even if she can find the power to defy it. Even if they can find the courage to confront it, it may be too late. David, just let us go. that can save their lives could shatter their minds. Scared stiff. Boy, this sounds familiar. Well, maybe. It sounds familiar because there's a 1945 film called Scared Stiff. There's a 1953 film called Scared Stiff. There's a 1987, not this one, but a Hong Kong film called Scared Stiff. There's a pinball game, a children's book, a 1991 horror collection, and a 2008 anthology, all called Scared Stiff. Uh, sounds familiar. It's ringing a bell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it, it <laughs> probably would. Was that the documentary? Was that the, like, the jail thing? No, that's no. Scared Straight. Straight, okay. I mean, that would have been its own t- type of toxic relationship, I guess. <laughs> um, this was a film, I honestly don't know why I saw it, but um, it's, It definitely stuck with me. So um, I thought that it was a little more well-known than it is. It has an Arrow release. Um, uh, They did a really good treatment on it. They've got a Blu-ray copy of it, and it's got some good behind-the-scenes stuff. Um, Rotten Tomatoes, for example, uh, question mark for the critics. (laughs) No idea. 40% for audience. Okay. Uh, Budget, no idea. Wikipedia, does not have a page. Wow. The Hong Kong version has a, like of that same name <laughs> has a page. I was like, what? I, I just not, like, and if I looked up the director, if I looked up the actors, it does not matter. This does not exist in a wiki. So, jeez. 
Die Tell me, am I, am I thinking of the same thing? I, I'm seeing like a poster and then the word scared stiff dripping blood. I think in so. Bad. There's, there's like hands going in yeah, yeah. around an image of some kind. I feel it. Sounds really well, familiar. I mean, it looked really bad, which is probably why I've never seen it. <laughs> That's fair. That is a fair <laughs> assessment initially. Um, so hmm. uh, let's, let's just let's get there. Um, so the director of this film is Richard Friedman, who has a name that sounds like, oh, you've done a lot of stuff. Um, he's done 34 titles, which is a fair amount, but um, you you might know him from Doom Asylum, Death Mask, <laughs> Phantom of the Mall, Eric's Revenge. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> or <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Uh, <laughs> he did a lot of TV movies. He He's done a little bit of things like Tales from the Dark Side, Friday the 13th. Um, he did four episodes of Baywatch Nights. Um, so he's kind of eclectic. I wouldn't say beyond his initial films. I don't know that he has a style anymore. Uh, Doom Asylum is a favorite here. Is it? Okay. Yes. I don't think I've yeah. seen Doom Asylum. Really bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, not surprised. The writer <laughs> for this is a name that you might recognize. Mark Frost of Twin Peaks. Right. Jeez. And Fantastic Four. The, one of the best versions, the 2005 version, unfortunately. Um, and Low bar. <laughs> yes. And it's weird, too, because once I figured that out, um, a lot of the font in the credits and all over the posters is super looks exactly like Twin Peaks font. So I don't know. It's interesting. I was like, is this like a Mark Frost trademark? I don't <laughs> Isn't this weird, like green and red font thing all about you. He actually had titled this film uh, something a little bit different, a little bit more helpful. He'd called it Ghost Diary, which is way more apt. Hmm. Then it was changed to the um, Masterson Curse, which also works, and then changed finally to Scared Stiff. Some places do still call it the Masters and Curse, not Wikipedia. <laughs> so, I checked. Uh, the special effects in this film are very, very good. And the people behind that um, probably circle back to. But a lot of this, a lot of these, the people involved in this had done very, very little um, up until this point, at least. For many people, it was the only thing they ever worked on. It uh, starred... Andrew Stevens, who plays David Young, the psychiatrist guy in a white coat. <laughs> um, he was in 33 episodes of Dallas and uh, is now a producer. He's done 132 uh, things as a producer, including Boondock Jeez. Saints, uh, 3,000 Miles to Graceland, and The Whole Nine Yards. So switched gears. Uh, Mary Page Keller, who's gorgeous. She plays our, really our lead heroine, Kate Christopher. She's been in 67 titles. Uh, Scared Stiff was her fourth role. It was a risk, quote unquote, to take her on. Um, she's currently <laughs> doing uh, Pretty Little Liars. She's done Heart of Dixie, a lot of like one episodes of TV things, but um, definitely has a big TV presence. She did something called Another World, which I don't know about, but she was in 33 episodes of that and do it. 54 episodes. David Ramsey plays George Masterson, who is like evil past ghost guy, I think. Um, he has been in three things. Uh, no, you would not have heard of the others. Nicole Fortier, uh, who plays his wife, ghost, old timey wife person. Elizabeth Masterson, who's in two things. And this guy named Jackie uh, Davis, who plays Detective Whitcomb, who's one of my favorite parts of this. And he was actually only in 12 things. <laughs> and unfortunately was in things like uh, Cape Fear's Jimmy the Dock Master. He was in, oh, I hate this. He was in Smokey and the Bandit as black man number one. <laughs> Rough. And Caddyshack yep, as Smoke Porthouse. Porterhouse. I don't know what that means, but anyway. Um, so this this film... Um, we open on the year 1857, Charlesburg. George Masterson is a horrible human being. He's selling off slaves as, and he's good at it apparently. Um, and it's really gross and really horrifying, uh, cause it's low budget eighties <laughs> fair. 
So it's whatever you think it is, is worse than that. <laughs> um, uh, and then he, he has his assistant guy runs up to him or his, um, I don't know what you would call it. His person who tends to him and this dude has like one eye and is all disfigured and weird looking. And he's like, they're doing something in your house. And he's like, not, not them, the help, the, you know, his, his slaves are doing something in my house. Um, and they are doing something in his house, something untoward. Uh, they have started a ritual to put a curse on him. And meanwhile, we also jump over to the Ivory Coast, where a tribe, also problematic as fuck, <laughs> um, has created an epitaph of him and is doing some kind of a ritual with this guy. Uh, so we know that it's kind of being happening in two places at once. It's some big, bad, horrible curse because this guy is a really, really horrible guy. Um, meanwhile, the wife, Elizabeth Masterson, walks in on their ritual. And I was like, uh-oh, she's going to like scream and be like, mom, the, the people are doing bad things. No, <laughs> actually kind of nice. Um, the, the guys halt and give her this really nice mask. And they're like, this will protect you and your son from um, from George. And then George, uh, George walks in and we cut out of that. Exactly. Mask up, stay safe. Mm -hmm. Mask up. <laughs> Absolutely. That is the theme of this. Cut to a singer is moving in with her psychiatrist turned boyfriend. Oh, jeez. Yep. <laughs> like mental institute psychiatrist oh, turned boyfriend uh, in the deep south into a this kind of gothic mansion um, along with her very young son. Uh, the place definitely is a mess. It's it's basically been untouched since our previous scene with Mr. George. And as they start to uh, go through the house, they discover some clues as to its dark past. Um, her son, meanwhile, is having strange premonitions about moving to this place. Um, he's very uneasy about it. He's not sure about her boyfriend. On top of that, there's pigeons and pigeons mean something. I'm not sure what but there sure are a lot of pigeons. In pigeons this movie. from hell. Mm. Pigeons <laughs> forewarning with their little coo coo, <laughs> and like it doesn't really make sense because I think the pigeons are meant to signify the evil dead George, but instead they're just there. And by introducing them with the start of like her son in this really fun, it looks like an LA like mansion or apartment, like an upscale apartment, I should say. And there's pigeons there. So I don't know. I don't know what the pigeons mean, but something, something <laughs> ominous. Um, she starts to have these dreams of this guy and they're finding things like a diary from Elizabeth that talks about their love and then kind of slowly talks about how George is becoming bad. Um, there's a musical piece. And because um, our, our lead heroine is a singer, she immediately sits down at the piano and starts to play it, which makes uh, George appear before her. She's having dreams where he starts to appear more and more. Then he starts to appear in real life, including uh, taking over David, her boyfriend, from time to time, including in the shower, and then she just has sex with him anyway, so I don't know. <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. Um, so she she wants to leave. She's like, yo, um, David, this place be crazy. We got to get out of here. And he's like, yo, Kate, uh-uh, honey, I got stuff tied up here. We can't go anywhere. You stay put. But he's like really loving and like doctorly most of the time. And then occasionally he's like, you're crazy. And I thought we were past these visions of yours. And, you know, it's, it's very... Um, <laughs> toxic <laughs> your crazy seems like something a mental institute guy would not say i know to somebody, right? <laughs> and he doesn't most of the time <laughs> like when he should be saying it he's saying things that are very kindly and like oh let's just take a minute remember our exercises things like that and then other moments so i think the idea is that george is taking over him and making him into a ah, different okay. man right, right. Right. yes right. so um things happen there's a repair guy who gets um, a, a startled by pigeons. It does not turn out well for him. The little kid is playing in the back of the house with a bunch of like Tonka trunks, uh, Tonka trucks and different like 
you know, uh, building equipment trucks and stuff out in the sand and they all become very alive and move around very quickly and it's extremely fun and he enjoys it a lot. Oh, <laughs> you're, you're kind of selling me on this. Movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. I will say it's slow. It has a slow and problematic first and second part. So there's a lot of, it's, it's neat and it's interesting. There's moments that are really cool, but there's also a lot of like sitting around and like, it's a bad B movie, like uh, bad wow. B movie stuff. Okay. A lot of talking, a lot of weird locations that aren't fully built out. Uh, however, I, I did enjoy the, the policeman who I mentioned before, Jackie Davis, who's just obsessed with watching basketball on TV and every scene he was like either craning his neck to like look at a TV. Like he gets in, <laughs> he goes to visit um, the psychiatrist and uh, he sits there with the mental patients watching um, basketball on TV. And then one of the mental patients gets up to change the channel and he loses his mind at him. <laughs> and the psychiatrist is like, uh, were you here for me? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> and then, like, at one point, um, Kate goes to visit him to talk further about um, strange things going on in the house. And he's like looking at something in his filing cabinet. And once she leaves, it's revealed that he has like a little C, um, CRTV in there. Oh, like geez. a teeny tiny one with like little bunny ears. And he's like watching the game. It's just nonstop. Oh, weird. So, what an odd habit to give somebody. I know. Yeah. <laughs> such a weird character trait, but I, I definitely enjoyed that a lot. It was a good comedic um, break in the action. Um, so this whole film, we're kind of going between flashbacks of Elizabeth's story with George and then Kate and um, her relationship that is devolving, I would say, with um, David. So they eventually discover that George had become after this ritual, this sort of monstrous creature and had killed Elizabeth and their son and shoved him in a trunk, which does not bode well since George is kind of overtaking David uh, in the flashbacks. He became more and more monstrous and he ended up with this like long tendril hair and a bumpy face. He had really exaggerated features. He became like a creature <laughs> before he got to the point where he, you know, shoved his kid in a box um, and just walked off. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Kate is extremely worried. David is not listening her, to her. And at one point, he basically does not let her leave. He refuses to let her leave and drugs her. He just pulls out a <laughs> big old needle and shoves it in her arm, which was very Good exciting. Times. <laughs> Shit starts to get really rough. Uh, David had gifted her son, uh, Jason, this nice Apple II computer. <laughs> um, the computer comes alive and kind of and projects in very early CGI style this sort of um, holographic image of the mask, like the mask might be useful right now. <laughs> After a couple of other scenes, like a dream sequence where she's like, they're like, the mask, you should probably find it. That might help you in this particular situation of yours. And she's got half of it, but it's can't find it. comes off half. like a video game prompt. It, yeah, it's, it is, uh, I mean, I'm putting words in. Is it an allegory now. for our time? Uh, no, no, no. It definitely feels like early computer stuff that people who had no idea what computers were about were doing. Oh, I like that. Yeah, very, very strange. And then uh, she gets fucking crazy. I mean, I, this film goes from zero to a thousand so fast and so well that you're like, what is this movie? All of a sudden, the special effects go from like, eh, not great to holy shit. Am I watching like a Friday the 13th movie right now? Or like, what is going on? And I mean, it's weird. They give it their all. So the kid has this um, protective. He doesn't have like a blanket or a toy that he, he needs to sleep. He has a problematic Native American face lamp that is <laughs> bright yellow. And needless to say, at one point, it becomes a giant paper mache head that floats down a hallway. Um, there are doors um, that appear down this long hallway and everything gets really misty while, um, of course, David slash George is chasing Kate and her son. And in each door is some bananas thing, uh, including the mental patient's area that she probably had used to hang out and be in um, and that um, David works in and they are all like 
bigger versions of themselves. Hmm. And one guy, all I all I will say is head zipper. I want you to find out what that means. <laughs> Beautiful. It's absolutely incredible. Hopefully it's um, nothing like the Edward Lee header. And anybody who knows that, just move on. <laughs> I know nothing of this. Nothing of this. So basically, the last 30 minutes of this film make it all worth it. It's a bad movie up until then. Like, it's pretty a pretty rough watch. But in the last 30 minutes, it becomes a brilliant film. Wow. Wow. So I definitely recommend it. I will say, unfortunately, the the acting is a little rough. The sun is particularly bad. Um, uh, the problematic, the worst parts are definitely the pro- problematic African American culture, uh, cultural references, and slave scenes, and the Native American lamp are all very. Each time you see it, there's also a couple <laughs> of like plot points that are very strange. Um, there's like a teen death, maybe like the babysitter might or might not have died, but there's no lead up to it. And it's her ghost like says to, or her dead corpse says to <laughs> Kate, well, next time you drive me home. And like, and it's like, what did you get killed by somebody? What did, did, um, uh, David kill you? What's happening? A little bit of trivia about this. Um, as much as I could find which was all on IMDb, which I hate relying on, but that's okay. It was filmed in a mansion, um, primarily. The owner of the mansion requested that they avoid damaging this very old and expensive chandelier. So they took it down and they um, put it away for the whole of principal photography, locked it behind this door. When they went to put it back up, um, only one person had the key, by the way, to the door. It was behind. (laughs) When they um, got it out of the closet, it was smashed to pieces. Whoa. Yeah. It was completely destroyed. Um, and they had to send it out for repairs, which cost them over $25,000. Holy shit. More than the movie. Yeah. Yeah. I am pretty sure. (laughs) Um, I mean, I think the movie was the cost of the paper mache and and the glue and the whatever else it took to make all those effects. Um, Mary Page Keller, who is the star of this and by far has the most acting credits, um, was hired so close to principal photography that they didn't have time to get her clothes for a wardrobe. So she just had to use her own, um, which is great because she's super hip. She's unbelievably hip through this whole thing. <laughs> the opening scene of the voodoo cult, as I had mentioned before, was shot without a fire marshal in a state <laughs> park close to the mansion. It's one of those films. The voodoo uh, cult chanting was entirely constructed by the director. Ha 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 ha. Uh, <laughs> David Ramsey, the director, uh, loved. Oh no, I'm sorry. David Ramsey, the actor who played George, loved his monster makeup a lot, but it did take four hours to do each and every time. There's um, a song that. Um, so the the lead character Kate is, uh, as I mentioned, she's a singer. She's like kind of a pop star. She has a music video. She keeps going back to to keep filming on, and it's this song called "Beat of the Heart." It is unbelievably catchy. Oh, <laughs> I will say that is a really great part. As I, right now, I got the beat of the heart, the beat of the heart. Oh my god! Okay. <laughs> and then the music that she plays part with on the piano, like kind of sounds like it, and you're like, ooh, ooh, connection. Um, <laughs> when filming a scene in which um, there's like, like I said, shit gets wild. Uh, Jason, the little kid, has to jump out of the way of a moving car. Apparently, this scene. Uh, resulted in the car coming within inches of hitting him. His parents were furious and insisted on him being paid a stunt fee, which he was awarded. <laughs> I was like, you're so mad that you don't take your kid off the set and go like, uh-uh, not, not safe, going away now. No, no, you go, that was really, really dangerous. He should get paid more. <laughs> so uh, they did. they did, in fact, oblige on that. And you can do that again as long as you pay more. That sounds like some savvy parents to me. (laughs) Uh, Definitely some Hollywood parents, that's for sure. Um, It's one of the first films to feature an Apple II computer. All of the skeletons in this film are real. The pigeons that were used in the film left excrement everywhere while filming. Um, The end of the film has, I'm I'm not going to say what happens. I will say there's kind of multiple multiple endings so it's weird um but it does result result in a fall out of a window by somebody and then the next scene that somebody is not right out the window they are several feet away in a fountain it's very funny um it's like wait how did you fall that 
far. That is unreal. You went like across the yard. Um, apparently the filmmakers did notice this while filming, but they kind of hoped no one else would. <laughs> Uh, the music is by the Barber Brothers, who is really just one person named Billy Barber, which I thought was particularly great. <laughs> and um, the best part about this film, though, is that um, the way this film came to be with Arrow, it was uh, re-released basically because of the obsession of one fan who's a film historian named Robert Ellinger, who saw it. Um, it was on the shelves of a VHS rental store. It was one of the last ones still running in 2004. He was intrigued, picked it out, picked it up and just fell in love with it. He started trying to track down anything he could of it, including posters, promo items. Um, he managed to get a piece of the cost, one of the costumes, and he wanted to get um, a copy of the master soundtrack. He contacted the producer, Daniel Backer, who had disowned the film at this point and was shocked anyone would mention <laughs> it this long after its release. And together, they actually worked and um, found the original negatives in an MGM vault in Pittsburgh, as oh, well as geez. a huge like treasure trove of material um, for like promo stuff. Backner then contacted Friedman, the director, and they secured together a restoration with Arrow Video who gave it a Blu-ray uh, release. And then Backner, Friedman, and Ellinger all did the commentary track on the DVD, which I thought was extremely nice. Billy Barber came back and performed a piano cover of Beat of the Heart. And as a thank you <laughs> for setting it in motion, Backner gave um, Ellinger some negatives from the film out of his own personal collection. So It's currently 47% off on, Is it really? on Amazon. Go for, for the it. The Blu-ray. It's, it's it's, I don't know. I enjoyed it. I bought it for not there, full price, but not not full price. There were nine in stock. There are now eight in stock. So. <gasps> <Ooh. laughs> wow. Man, yeah. this is what happened Sold when you me did on it. Dream Demon. I did the exact same thing. <laughs> okay. Oh, I woke up when you stopped talking. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> I can't handle you right now. <laughs> I made that interesting, sir. Uh, yeah, I loved it. Uh, can't wait to not check it out. My movie, if anyone cares, is from 1998, and it is called Bride of Chucky. Budget twenty five million. Holy shit! <laughs> Box office fifty one million worldwide. So wow. probably made its money back, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Rotten Tomatoes critics on this is only forty six percent. Audience agrees with them forty six percent. Wow, oh, weird. <laughs> Directed okay. by Ronnie Yu, who has done. Um, he's got sixteen Chinese film credits. Most of them are very highly regarded, and then he also uh, did this which gave him the Freddy versus Jason film right after this. And he did a, an episode of fear itself. And then he's kind of dropped off the face of the planet. I can't figure out what he's doing. <laughs> written by Don Mancini, who has written every single one of the child's play movies. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Of which this is number six, I believe. <laughs> how do you know how many there were? Um, I might, Okay. I might. At some point. <laughs> um, he also wrote a couple episodes of Hannibal and Channel Zero. Oh, cool. Oh, wow. It stars the smoking hot Jennifer Tilly. 
I love her so much. 127 <laughs> credits. You might know her from a voice that sounds like this. And Bullets Over Broadway, Bound and The Muse. Brad Dourif, who uh, is the voice of Chucky, 173 credits. And if you don't know Brad, you've just not been watching American cinema. Uh, <laughs> One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Exorcist Three, uh, The Lord of the Rings trilogy, which is kind of American cinema, and just <laughs> a million other movies, or actually 170 other movies. And Catherine Heigl, oh, who you would know from Roswell, and uh, I believe she torpedoed her uh, career with Grey's Anatomy. Oh yeah, quite thoroughly. And uh, I see now that, that she is popping up in a brand new movie called Fear of Rain, another horror film. Huh. So, Yeah, she's got a pretty terrible reputation. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> I think she started in um, Hallmark movies. Oh. She was in like Hallmark movies and then, yeah, she got, she freaked out at Seth Rogen after Knocked Up. Am I thinking mm -hmm. the right person? I think so. Yeah. yeah and that yes. was what, yes. like her turning on that film, like fucked her over. <laughs> right. So uh, Jennifer Tilly plays Tiffany, who is a former lover and accomplice of serial killer Charles Lee Ray, who we all know inhabits the Chucky doll from all of the movies. You know what? I think this is number four. I've only ever seen the first one, so I didn't realize it's the same guy just keeps jumping back into Chucky. No, the Chucky doll just, just... continued to survive from oh, movie to movie. Oh, okay. That makes sense. <laughs> all right. I'm with you now. Uh, and the first one, pretty good. The second and third ones, not so good. Uh, spoiler, I loved this movie and I'm a little surprised that it's got a 46%. I'm with you on that. I really liked Bride. It's so much fun. Yeah. So, um, she acquires Chucky's remains, uh, after the last movie, uh, where he got like burned and torn apart or something. And she crudely stitches him back together. Ooh. And then she performs the same voodoo ritual that originally got him stuck in the body and uh, brings him back in the body. So he's like, hey, thanks, baby, and all this stuff. And <laughs> yeah, she's, uh, she's in love with this guy. Chucky, who is still intent on becoming human again, he lays out a plan to retrieve the body switching amulet that he was wearing the night he was killed. And he knows that the amulet was buried along with his real body in a cemetery. In Hackensack, New Jersey. Oh, Not what old a great Jersey. name. Is that where Hackensack <laughs> comes from? Oh, I think you're thinking of Hacky Sack, but <gasps> I don't know if you're right. If that's where it came from or not. Tiffany, however, thinks that she and Ray are just going to like pick up where they left off. And she presents Chucky. Well, she shows Chucky this diamond that he had left for her, this diamond ring. And uh, he starts laughing at her because he realizes that she believes the gift to be an engagement ring. And he has to explain to her that he stole it off of one of his wealthier victims before he killed her. And so Tiffany, in a rage, locks him in this playpen type thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then as a mocking gesture, she um, gives him a female version of him kind of all dressed up in a um, wedding <laughs> gown and says, you know, here, you can live with this. So uh, these guys are uh, are hilarious to be around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The love, you can feel the love in the air. Um, <laughs> Chucky breaks free and while she is uh, enjoying a bubble bath with wine and all this stuff oh, in her God. trailer, um, hey, wow. she's got a little black and white TV on the edge of the tub and uh, <laughs> he, he jumps in, knocks the thing, the TV into the tub and kills her, right? And then to be a real dick, he uses that voodoo ritual to put her in the body of the doll in the wedding dress. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> so now he's, um, he's saying, you know, okay, yeah, I did this shit to you, but in order for us to both get out of this, we need to go get that amulet that I am buried with. That is the main <laughs> thrust of this movie. Yeah. Also in this movie is a secondary plot line of these two young kids, Jesse and Jade, who are eloping to uh, this cheapo wedding service. And uh, the dolls get involved in their story in that they hop a ride in their car while they're doing this road trip. And the kids don't know it. So all of this horrible shit that starts happening is following these kids. Uh, at one point, now... 
Chucky and Tiffany are kind of watching behind the scenes and seeing these kids and Chucky, you know, hates them. His initial thing <laughs> is let's kill these kids. But Tiffany has buried within her a kind of a heart of gold and she's really rooting for these kids to, to get Aww. married. She knows that the dad of the daughter is a sheriff and he's not happy with this kid who's a little rebellious, but a good Aww. kid and all this stuff. So all of this stuff is going on and she's like behind the scenes making sure nothing bad happens to them by killing people and stuff oh like that. Oh my God, <laughs> that's, that's so good. So um, the kids end up meeting a pair of swingers who uh, take them back and pickpocket their money. While they're sitting there worried about being broke and everything, Tiffany follows the thieves to their private room at, where she tosses a bottle of champagne at the mirrored ceiling above them while they're fucking. Oh, yeah. And then all of the um, shards of mirror come crashing down on them and kill them all. Chucky, who had been watching this, is aroused by the spectacle, and the two of them make love, make doll love in this uh, <laughs> this really swanky, uh, gross Vegas blood-soaked room. <laughs> so the kids are now all caught up in this, and the cops think that they're responsible for this trail of death and destruction that has been following them. So they finally figure out that uh, the dolls are alive in a fairly funny scene. And uh, when that happens, then the uh, the kids are taken hostage by the dolls and they're forcing them to get them to where they need to go. Um, <laughs> at one point, Jesse is asking Chucky, you know, how, how did this even happen? How are you guys even a thing? And Chucky says... Uh, uh, if it were a movie, it would take three or four episodes or three or four sequels just to explain this story. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the kind of movie it is. <laughs> uh, when they get to their uh, actual place that they've been trying to get to, this cemetery and everything, it turns out that Chucky's plan has been to switch him and Tiffany's souls into the bodies of the kids. And Tiffany is, oh. um, she's really like heartbroken to hear this because she loves this girl and uh, really wants them to make it. <laughs> and while he's performing the ceremony, Tiffany shows up behind him and stabs him in the back and then gives a great quote from the Bride of Frankenstein and says, oh, Chucky, look at us. Don't you see? We belong dead. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as Chucky is screaming and cursing, um, the police lieutenant, who's been pursuing them the whole time shows up and he sees that the dolls are alive and responsible for all of this. So um, he tries to intervene and he gets hurt and uh, Jade, the girl, she takes a detective's gun and aims it at Chucky who promises to one day return, just like in every sequel of the film series. <laughs> he says, you know I'm going to return, but dying is such a bitch. <laughs> and Chucky is shot to death and his lifeless body collapses next to his lifeless human shell. The lieutenant then radios in to report that Jade and Jesse are innocent, so he clears them and, and allows them to run away together. Uh, but before the rest of the police unit can arrive, the lieutenant discovers Tiffany's body. After poking her a few times, she's all burned up and everything. She suddenly springs to life and uh, he starts screaming as a <laughs> screeching, sharp-toothed baby doll emerges from beneath Tiffany's dress oh my and God. attacks him. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> Roll credits. Oh, my God. <laughs> this movie is so much fun because, uh, especially because the actor portraying the sheriff father of Jade is John Ritter. And yeah. he's so good in this. I mean, you'd know him from Three's Company and uh, a couple of other, you know, silly things. And he hams it up so well in this. He's having such a great time. Uh, yeah. So I really, really love this movie. I was really surprised to see that it only had a 46% yeah. rating. And I, I thought that I remember it having good reviews when it came out. It seems to me it's one of those that the uh, hardcore Chucky people didn't like much initially. I don't know if that's changed, but uh, it's, it's a little self-referential mm. and humorous about it. So that could be it. Um, a little bit of trivia. This is Brad Dourif's personal favorite of the child's play movies. Yeah. Oh. I can see that. Uh, I love this. There was a planned album of love songs featuring Brad Dourif and Jennifer huh? Tilly singing <laughs> as their doll counterparts. Whoa. <laughs> it is revealed in the movie commentary that Tiffany was to sing Killing Me Softly with his song. <laughs> <laughs> Chucky was intended to sing House of the Rising Sun and the two were to share a duet 
of Hit the Road, Jack. Oh, my God. <laughs> that would have been amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come okay. on, Mondo. So if this is number four, <laughs> this is followed by Seed of Chucky, which is five, Curse of Chucky, which is six, and finally Cult of Chucky, which is number seven. So seven movies in the franchise as of this time. And a remake. And, that's, and a remake and a planned uh, TV series. Oh, Oh, geez. That's coming? Yeah, that is just called Chucky. And uh, when I saw that on IMDb, I looked into that and Don Mancini corrected or created it and has written and will probably direct oh, wow. several episodes. And I episodes, assume so. Brad Dourif is going to start him. I would, I would assume so. Huh. Wow. Um, I, I do kind of like when a creative who latches on and just says, yeah, I'm riding the sucker out. I'm just, <laughs> this has made going. my career. I'm going to keep going with it as long as I can. There have also <laughs> been so many people who who back away. Well, I mean, Spielberg is a really famous example of this. He didn't yeah. want to do Jaws 2. Right. And uh, when they kept pressuring him, he came up with an idea that was completely different. And, and that makes sense because just like all of these movies, Friday the 13th, Jaws, any of those kind of movies, you can't really tell anything but that story over and over again. Right. Yeah. Um, Spielberg has since said, I wish that I had done Jaws 2 hmm. because... Yeah. Wow. Now this sequel and all the other sequels <laughs> on it are based on this movie I did and I had nothing to do with them and couldn't at least try and steer them yeah. in, in the right yeah. direction. Mm -hmm. uh, one fat last bit of trivia. Uh, the taglines on this movie are fun. <laughs> Here comes the bride. There goes everyone else. Ah. <laughs> the honeymoon's going to be a killer. Oh. Very nice. Or my favorite, hmm. this Halloween. Chucky gets lucky. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh. I remember the uh, the trailer for this showing the uh, the silhouettes of them, the dolls making love in the blood-soaked room. And I remember everybody in the theater just going, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like it. It might be my favorite of the Chucky movies, actually. But I was never a huge Chucky fan, so that probably doesn't bode well. The first <laughs> one is a good killer doll movie. Yeah. The second and yep. third one are stuck in that, uh, that Jaws or Friday the 13th yeah. remake thing where, or not remake, but sequel where it's just the same fucking story over and over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This one, they go completely different with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the subsequent sequels also go completely different yeah. with each one to a, uh, to a much lesser effect. So mm -hmm. very cool. I, yeah. I'm definitely intrigued. I will definitely check that out. It's fun. You don't really need to see the, the other, other movies. Two. No. no, no. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, is it just more like children find doll? Yeah. Okay. And and it's the same kid yep. in oh, the first it? three. Yeah. And, oh, and stuff like that. Uh, th this one is so fun because at one point, like John Ritter, he he gets killed by getting a ton of nails in his head <laughs> and he looks a little like pinhead as he's dead. And Chucky is looking at him and going, why does this look so familiar to me? Of course, dimension has the Hellraiser franchise as well. Oh, and it was yeah. like, you know, it's just, it's just a fun movie for horror fans. Yep. That's really neat. So that brings us to the end of the show. And, um, the next topic, which I wish, Eric, do you know what it is? <laughs> what is Vanessa's next topic? Oh, my God. Oh, I'll let her tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, this is going to be a complete shocker to you guys. Uh, but I noticed <laughs> that I, it seemed like we had not yet really talked about cults. We talked about mm -hmm. secret societies and we've talked yeah. about ideas kind of around things that might be yeah, cults. Satan and things yeah, like that. Yeah, but not straight up cults. So, cults. We're doing cults. Nice. Well... I hope I can think of something good for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name I, of <laughs> I have faith. I have faith in you. I bet I bet you'll figure it out. All right. Well, hey, um, big thanks to everybody, but uh, an especially big shout out to uh, Dan Woodski, who uh, who wrote on the Facebook page uh, that he was watching anything for Jackson based on our uh, our recommendation of it. That's so cool. So, yeah, it's a good one too. Nice pick. Nice one to go for. Yeah. If you guys are watching something that we have recommended, let us know. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it feels like we're in a void here, so we have no idea if anybody actually cares with the stuff we're watching or not. Yeah. But uh, post it on the Facebook page or something like that. Link to us. Tweet it. Instagram us. Yeah. Wherever you want. 
and we we want to know your thoughts. Uh, we all loved anything for Jackson, and it turns out Dan did too. So that's cool. Oh, nice. That's very cool. Um, and before we wrap up, I also want to mention. So I we talked about Cobra Kai earlier today, mm-hmm. and um, I, I had worked on this really fun kung fu film where um, the bad guy from Karate Kid Two and is in season three of Cobra Kai is a producer and has a small fun role in um, this martial arts film called Paper Tigers. It's actually going to be at the Burien Drive-In as part of the Seattle Asian American Film Fest, March 6th at 7 p.m. So if you want to go see a movie at a drive-in, this one's pretty good. It's fun. That's it's really cool. fun. Nice. Okay. That's coming up too. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's going to be soon. So, okay. Uh, many thanks to everybody who's always liking sharing the posts as usual. Uh, we have zero budget for advertising. So the, you are doing the advertising. Thanks, everybody. We'll be back in one week. We're talking Colts, and we'll see you then. Thank you. Goodbye. Our show is recorded somewhere high above Naval Station Everett at the nexus of all realities and is engineered and produced by Eric Margaret. Our theme music is Strange Eons Part 1 by the band Nightshade and is used with permission. Find Strange Eons Radio on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, wherever fine podcasts are found.